here gathered because we are all redeemed of him. Praise the name of God. It is that blood of Jesus Christ that redeemed you. That he gave you the right to be called the son of God. Praise the name of God. To belong to the family of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter number 26 so that we may read together as we take the Holy Communion as we remember that sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross are you there? and we shall read together from verse number 17. I'll just go down that way that we may get the context. On the first day of the festival of an unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations to eat the Passover? The Passover was a feast that the children of Israel were celebrating every year to remember their redemption in Egypt. On that night, when God told them to slaughter a lamb and smear the blood of it on the doorposts of their houses, so that when God was destroying the firstborns of the children of Egypt, he may pass over the children, the, 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 the houses of the children of Israel. And the children uh, of Israel were commanded to continue remembering this day every year. Praise the name of God. And uh, they continued to remember this day every year. Jesus Christ lived on earth for 33 years and therefore he must have participated for every year for a long period of time in celebrating the Passover. Jesus died for you on the cross. If any question you are there and you would want to commit your life to Jesus this day, you may raise your hand from wherever you are and we shall pray together. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you desire to do so this morning. Thank you. Lord, we thank you because of all this that you have redeemed by your blood. I pray, God Almighty, that you keep them and protect them, King of glory. Protect them from every snare, from every scheme, from the, every plan of the evil one, King of glory, Jehovah God. And may they never forget the price that you paid for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. Yeah. Praise God, church. We have all been blessed. Thank you, Lucy, so much for leading us so well. God bless you too. And I believe there are more people who know the memory verse. Maybe they'll come like Nicodemus to you, Pastor. You're welcome also. I, I believe we know. It's not that we don't know that we are seated there, but we have been learning and God has been transforming us each day. So you are welcome to say the memory verse any other time. In your CLGs, when you gather, you can still say the memory verse. Uh, so we begin by praying for that family. The Bible says that we mourn with those who mourn, we rejoice with those who rejoice. Death is not easy and in this season we know that we are also celebrating the death of Jesus and his resurrection. So let us pray that the God of all comfort is going to comfort that family. 
Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, may your presence this afternoon. Father, standing in the gap on behalf of your children, thank you because of Pastor Samaria and their family. Thank you, Father, because you bless them with their dad, oh God, and they have, uh, you have given him the gift of life this far, oh God. And a time has come, oh God, for him to depart from the earth, oh God. For your word says that it is as appointed for man to die once and after that judgment, oh God. I thank you, Father, because he, he knew you, oh God. You had revealed yourself to him, oh God, and he walked in your path. And now that, Father, we know that there is in store for him the crown of righteousness that is in store for all of us who believe, oh God. We thank you, Father, for his life. We pray for his family. At this time, oh God, when they may not understand why they have so many questions, oh God, just like we have, oh God, as human beings. There are things that are mysteries to us, but they are known to you, oh God. There are things that you have hidden from us, but Father, you know them, oh God. We pray that God Almighty, that you may comfort this family. You may be there for them, oh God. That Father, whatever they need for them to get through this season, oh God, that Father, you may walk with them. I pray that, Father, you may give them peace, O oh God. They are far away from their family. They are in a foreign land, O oh God. They may have so many questions, O oh God. But, Father, you have made us a family for them, O oh God. I pray that, Father, you may help us. You may shed your love abroad in our hearts that we may reach out to them with the love of Jesus Christ, that they may not feel as orphans. They may not feel as if you have left them, O oh God. But, Father, let us be your hands in this time. Let us be the body of Christ to embrace them Lord with your love that Father they may feel that for sure God you are with them oh God we pray for peace we pray for comfort we pray that Father you will walk with them and for us Father we surrender because when one of us is mourning we are all mourning that God you comfort all of us you give us words you give us the right actions that we need to do Father to walk with them we thank you and we honor you in Jesus name we pray Amen Praise God. The crucifixion, it was not only meant to kill the person, it was meant to make the person go through a lot of suffering, made to carry the cross, they would be flogged, they would be stripped naked, and they would be paraded with a crime hung around their neck. So that whatever crime they had committed would be hung around their neck. And for Jesus, his crime was the king of Jews. I don't know what kind of crime is that the king of Jews. So that was the cry of Jesus. So after the person went to the place where they were to be crucified, they would be nailed on a wooden beam and then they would be lifted up and left to die slowly. Mostly the dead would come as a result of exhaustion, so just be exhausted and as a result of asphyxiation. Asphyxiation, do you understand that? Yeah, it's a medical term. It means the deprivation of oxygen. So they would die slowly. You can imagine that kind of death. And for the Romans, in fact, they would support the victim sometimes so that they do not die quickly, so that they just continue to breathe, but they are suffering. And eventually they would die, sometimes even after a whole week of suffering. So it was a slow and painful death. But uh, with all this, with Jesus understanding all this, we see that he chose to die this way. It was not an accident for him. He chose to die this way. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. He says that, Now Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he would raise to life. So we are saying that it was not a surprise to Jesus. He knew that he was going to die this way. John 3 verse 14 says, um, John 3 verse 14 and 15, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus knew the kind of death he was going to die, 
and he chose to die that way. Because if it was only about dying, Jesus would have chosen any other way. There are so many ways that people die. He could have chosen an accident. He could have chosen, maybe somebody would have stabbed him and died. Then even blood would still have been shed. But we see that Jesus chose the painful death. And he chose to die on the cross. So, what, what is the message of the cross then? Why, after Jesus did all this, what message do we have? And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 to, to 25, Paul says that, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but, they pre but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So what is the message of the cross for us this day? The core message of the cross is that we are preaching Christ crucified. There is a lot we can preach about. We can preach about Christ the healer. We can preach about Christ our provider. But the core message is Christ crucified. Because if he was not crucified, healing would not have come. Our provision would not have come. So the message of the cross is the message of Christ crucified. And then we are told that it is foolishness to the Greeks. Why is it foolishness to the Greeks? Because we see that in the Greek culture, this was a culture of heroes. And they had so many heroes in their, in their meals and all that. They would uh, talk about heroes like Achilles and Hercules and all those. And when you read about these heroes, one of the things or their core characteristics were that they were very strong. They were fierce, they were bold, they were brave, and they even had supernatural powers. So for the disciples to promote Jesus, uh, crucified, it was going to be very hard, especially for the Greeks, for the Greeks, because the Greeks would not understand how the disciples would promote their hero, Jesus, and say that he was crucified, he died such a miserable death, according to the, to the Greeks. For them, their heroes did not die foolish deaths, in quotes, because for them, they would want their heroes to fight back you know, they should have done a lot and emerged victorious, not through the cross. And then to the, to the Jews, we are told that it was a stumbling block. Why was it a stumbling block? Because according to the Jews, cursed is anyone who is hung on the tree. And they could not understand how the Messiah, how the Son of God, would become an object of curse by hanging on the tree. So for them that was a stumbling block. They could not understand how God would die that way. How the Messiah that they hoped for, that would come as the, uh, as the one riding on a horse and restoring the kingdom to them, they could not understand how he would end his life that way. But we know that all this happened so that prophecy might be fulfilled. And there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament that were prophesied about Jesus Christ. And um, uh, a preacher called Benihim says that there are about 23 prophecies that were fulfilled in the six hours that Jesus hung on the cross or that he underwent the, the suffering on the cross. So we see it was necessary for Jesus to die on the cross so that prophecy would be fulfilled. And what did Jesus accomplish for us on the cross? When we look at Galatians chapter 3, uh, Galatians chapter 3 from verse 7, Uh, understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture was so that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So, those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. 
and verse 10, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ, verse 13, is the focus. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So we see one of the greatest things that Christ accomplished for us on the cross is that he redeemed us from the curse of the law. So what is the law? The law is the sum total of God's requirements and expectations for man's behavior, words, attitude, and then turning aside from this is sin, is considered sin. So everything God expected of us, and in terms of our behavior, in terms of our words and our attitudes, that is the law of God. And where do we get it? We get it in the books of the Old Testament, the books of Torah. And failure to keep that law, the curse of the law is the punishment and the suffering that comes upon us for disobeying the law of God. So to understand exactly what is the curse of the law, we need to look at the Old Testament and see what God said. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 26, God tells them that there are blessings of obeying the law and there is a curse for disobeying the law. And we see after they left Egypt and about 50 days later, in Mount Sinai, God gave them the law and the people promised to obey everything that was in the law. And again, God told Moses that after they had crossed Jordan, uh, when they had gone, gotten to the promised land, he told him in Deuteronomy 27, 12, I'm just summarizing so that we can go faster, uh, that when they got to that land, there were two mountains. There was Mount Gerizim and there was Mount Ebal. And he said that six tribes were to stand on Mount Gerizim and six tribes were to stand on Mount Ebal. And those on Mount Gerizim would pronounce a blessing to the people. Those on Mount Ebal would pronounce a curse to show that those who are obedient, they would obtain the blessings. And those who are disobedient, they would obtain the curses that were pronounced. And chapter 28 of Deuteronomy outlines these blessings and these curses. From verse 1 to 15, we see the blessings for obedience. From 15 to 68, we see the curses for disobedience. So we can see that in the curses that were there, it's a very long chapter. Maybe we can just read a few of the curses so that you understand what was the curse of the law. Some of the things that would come upon those who are disobedient. So from verse 15 it says, However, if you do not obey the law, uh, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees, I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So you see the curses were to come upon the people and even go ahead of them. So wherever, even in their future, as they got into their future, they would find the curses waiting for them there. You will be cast in the city and cast in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough would be cast. The fruit of your womb would be cast. The crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flock. You will be cast when you come in. You will be cast when you go out. So you continue with all the curses up to verse 68. It's very depressing to read through them. They are very, um, they are not good things that would come upon those who are disobedient. And majorly the curses will follow under, will fall under three categories. When you read through them, you will see that there is poverty, there is sickness, and there is spiritual death. Those were the main curses that were outlined there. And then uh, we see that the, the Bible says that the curse would come upon those who are disobedient. And you know, according to the law, when you break one, you have broken all of them. So it was not that I have kept five, if you have broken one, then I'm safe. No, the curse would come upon you for disobedience. So why was it so hard for the people to keep the law? Even us, why would it be so hard for us to keep the law? Because the law was the hard way. It required behavior that was contrary to the human nature. And it required behavior that was impossible and against our ability. 
Because when God, for example, says you shall love your enemies, is that easy for us to do? It is very hard. So it is contrary. For us, we want to love those who are uh, living near us, those who do good things to us. But the law required the impossible. And it also uh, required things that were against our ability. It required perfect compliance. You are not to do uh, you are not to do just a few of them and, and maybe be exempted from the punishment. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 28, Jesus even comes and says, you know, it has been said, do not commit adultery. But whoever looks at a woman lustfully has sinned. You know, it is so hard to keep the law. He again says, you know, you have been told do not murder. But whoever is angry with his brother is a murderer and all that. So the law was very hard, yet it required perfect compliance. And then, the law also refuses to accept good intentions. You cannot say that, you know, I am trying, I'm trying and the law will exempt you. No, it requires perfect compliance, not good intention. You don't say that you're trying, you had to be perfect. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order. So why did he redeem us? Verse 14. In order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So what was the blessing given to Abraham? We read that Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And for us when we believe, we gain the righteousness of Christ by faith. And that is what we call justification. We stand before God as if we have never seen. We are justified before God. We are not under the curse of the law. He does not inflict the punishment for disobedience because he looks at us through Jesus Christ. We who are in Christ. So that is one of the things that uh, Jesus accomplished for us by hanging on the cross. And so in the same way, in the verse that we read in John, Jesus said that in the same manner he would be lifted up and whoever would look upon him would have eternal life. So we see that God made Jesus to be a symbol of evil. We know snakes are a symbol of evil. When he took all our sins upon himself on that cross, when he took all the curses upon himself, he looked just like that snake. He, was, he looked so evil because he had carried the sins of men. But again, in God's wisdom, whatever is considered foolishness for many people, for the Greeks and those who do not believe, God says it is our redemptive plan. That was his redemptive plan for us, that whoever would look upon Jesus would live. It does not matter how far they would have gone away. The same way Jesus is the only savior of the world. We do not have many other saviors. There are people who say, you know, there are many ways to reach to God. No, that is a lie. It's only through Jesus. God said, make this snake and let it be put somewhere that whoever is beaten by the snakes, let him look upon the snake and they will live. So we have seen that Christ has redeemed us by hanging on the cross, by becoming the curse for us. He has redeemed us, not his planning to know that he will redeem us. It is already done. So we sit here as redeemed people. All of us who have Christ Jesus, over all of us who are in Christ Jesus, in God's eyes, we are no longer under any curse because the curses on Mount Ebal have been re removed from our lives by Jesus hanging on the cross for us. By Jesus doing our obedience, now we can walk in the blessing of God that we read about in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 to 15, which I will finish with. I want us to know the blessing that God has given us because Paul says that it is the message of the cross that is the power of God for us who believe. Uh, and even though once in a while we may see the symptoms of those curses in our lives, we have a solution. Sometimes when you read through all those curses, you can look at your life. Is there anything, is there anything of those curses that is in your life? And I know for most of us we will find something. But there is hope for us. God did not leave us without hope. God told us that he has given us Christ. And our part to, is to look to him so that we can live. In believing by faith. Because we receive all the promises of God through faith. So I will end by reading the blessings that God has given us. In Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you 
if you obey the Lord your God and you know that we are obedient through Jesus Christ, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops of your land and the to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. So that those are the blessings of God. And like we have seen that accepting the finished work of Jesus on the cross, his redemptive plan for us, and embracing his blessings and breaking away from the curses because the enemy will take advantage of our ignorance. We are told we should not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. If you do not know what Christ did for you, the enemy will not let you just have it like that. He needs to be evicted. He needs that eviction notice from your blessings. He, he does not give up so easily. You have to claim your blessings. You have to know the will of God through reading the word, through understanding what he did on the cross for you and taking the next step to believe and in prayer and by faith you claim these things. There is nothing that was left out of his redemptive plan. There is nothing that escaped the saving grace of God. Whatever sickness, whatever lack, whatever pain that is written in the curse of the law is not for the children of God. We are now under the blessing of God. We are told that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. So I don't know this afternoon whether there is any symptom of a curse, the curse of the law in your life, but Christ paid it, paid the price that we may live a free life. You don't have to live under the bondage of sin. You don't have to live under the bondage of Satan, whatever he has tried to put upon you. We know that he can use our ignorance, he can use deception, he can use so many other tricks. But we have the word of God. When we mix it with faith, we will begin to see the results. It may not have worked in the past, probably, because there's something you did not know, you walked in ignorance. But the more you get the light of God in you, we will we reign by light. There's a preacher who says that we are in a kingdom where we reign by light. So when you allow the light of God, when you know something, you can claim it. And in the uh, in the word of God, it has that proven pattern of performance that whatever God says, it is done and it is possible. And it has happened to others in the past. So what He has said. Go and study your Bible and claim those promises by faith and do not allow unbelief to make you whatever you can see. Because sometimes you may say I'm healed, yet the symptoms are still there. But keep pressing on and you will see the manifestation of the promises of God. It is true that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. It is not a story. It is very true. Go and claim your promises, not only now, but when you go back to your homes, keep claiming these promises. And we are going to hear so many testimonies that God is going to do in our midst. So we are going to pray. I believe we can just stand and uh, the worship team, you know the song, Look and Live. If you do not know, you can lead us in just one song. My brother, Lee, look to Jesus now. to just look and we shall find freedom, healing, 